Okay. Hi everyone, this is SmithyQ, SmithyQ.com, and I'm back with another video analysis. This one was played with another friend of the blog. This is against uh, Ral Ral. I believe this is our fourth game. Um, I was black, and I was able to convert a very nice end game that I wanted to share. And in fact, I'm going to actually um, convert this, if you will, into two different lessons rather than having one video that, you know, is basically an hour. I'm going to have this first video, I'm going to go through the entire game in more of a general way, sharing my thoughts of what happened, what didn't happen, trying to analyze it that way. And then I'm going to create a separate um, video just on the end game. So that'll be coming up uh, within a couple days after this. So anyway, if we just jump right in, it's uh, he was I was again black, and I decided to play c5 here, and then go with b5, the Benko Gambit, which is um, well after let's just go all the way because he accepted both pawns. The Benko Gambit is a really interesting opening where black in general sacrifices pawns, but. Um, the compensation isn't so much immediate development, but as it is a really sound position with long-term pressure. I first played the Benko Gambit, gosh, I don't know, 15 years ago? It was a Benko Gambit thematic, so you played it both as white and black. It was like 20 games altogether. And I remember thinking, this is a really interesting opening. And then I never played it again. <laughs> well, I decided to uh, try it out. I've uh, even learned some theory behind this, apparently. The modern way to play the Benko Gambit, instead of taking right away, is we finish development, like so, or we castle. And then white played bishop f4, and immediately we're out of theory. <laughs> so, or out of the theory that I know of all the games. So, you know, they say, I keep saying it, you know, don't spend too much time on openings, right? And this is exactly why. So. Bishop f4. Like, it's a fine move, it's a neural move, it's just not one of the most critical ones. There's a whole bunch of things I could have done. In, in, in this position, I played queen a5, which is one, again, it's a very thematic move in the Benko Gambit, and immediately there's pressure, because the knight is pinned, and then after something like knight e4, I unleash the bishop and the knight, everything is attacking the knight. So that'd be absolutely great. And, um, Ral underestimates this and plays g3. Now g3, let me just back up for a second. After something like bishop takes a6, which would lead to a very normal type of Benko position, um, the most, white has two options. He can play four, e4, then after take, sorry, take, yes, that's the way it's done. Um, he can't castle, however, it's really easy to play king there, there, and everything's fine. And he's got a strong center. That's one possibility. The second possibility, is to play g3, bishop g2, and then castle normally. There's advantages and disadvantages to both approach. Obviously, in the other one, he can't castle, so he's losing time. In this one, he can castle, so everything is great. However, his bishop is staring on the long diagonal, which often doesn't do very much, and the bishop needs to reroute somewhere else, usually. After queen a5, g3, that... Um, did nothing to stop my plan with knight e4 to jump right in, and all of a sudden white is in you know, a little bit of trouble. Um, a better move, a move that um, I completely underestimated, and what would take advantage of the early bishop uh, move, would be to play a7. The idea is that I could not take with the rook, because I'd lose the knight, so that's not very good. So that would mean I would have to take with the queen. And now, white can get a um, pretty normal Benko position. So e4, let's say d6, bishop d3, and then let's say I play bishop a6. He can just castle, and white's got um, the best of both worlds, so to speak. He's been able to castle normally, and he's got his strong center and his bishop here. And then, you know, if we just do, you know, some random moves, you know, a6, something like this. We can see that black's pressure on the uh, center is non-existent, like it would be in the game. And the queen side, white is ready to possibly play bishop b5 or knight b5 and block black's attack over there. And so white, um, black would have to work really hard to prove he has compensation because, again, black is down a pawn. I think this is the right way, and I think this actually suggests, if we back up, that my queen a5 probably wasn't the best move because of a7. So either bishop takes 
Or I could have perhaps played queen b6. Because then um, I'm pressuring this pawn here, the queen is defending the knight, and if you try to play a7, the, the, the rook can take it, so everything would be fine. I think that would be better. So if I got this position again, I would have played queen b6. However, he played g3, knight e4, and all of a sudden uh, black is taking over the initiative. He plays rook c1, which is fine. I'm pretty sure bishop d2 is the best move. However, rook c1 is fine, knight takes c3. And if you just look what happens in the game, it was pawn takes, bishop takes, bishop, dupe, 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 dupe. We reached here, where we got an early endgame. And this is fantastic, because uh, the Benko Gambit, in particular, is an endgame opening. So what I mean by that is that, again, it's funny, because this is how it's an atypical Gambit. Um, the... Uh, sacrificing a pawn, but you love the end game because the end games are often better for black, even if you're down a pawn. And here, we're going to uh, win this pawn right back and we're fine. So we'll back up. All this was very natural, but it wasn't forced. In this position, black hat, sorry, white has a better move than just b takes c3. And that's queen d2. This is the move I was expecting him to play. Um, if you don't know this idea, it's very hard to see. However, it's somewhat common in certain openings. And the idea, of course, is that the queen is uh, pinning the other queen, um, will recapture the knight. And so what I was going to play, I'm going to win the pawn, and then after take, 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 which position that's very similar to the game. But there's a key difference. In the game, we reach this position, where after um, bishop takes a6, notice how there's a pawn here on the a file, which my rook is staring at. This is an incredibly weak pawn that white must always guard, must defend. If instead, if we look at this queen d2 line, where after take, 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 there is no a pawn. The, the a file is completely open. Black instead has a c, uh, sorry, white has a c pawn instead, which will likely go to c4 at some point. And the difference in this position is that it's much, uh, in both cases, black is better. Black has the initiative going into this endgame. However, this one is much easier for white to defend because his pawn structure is better, right? In fact, all of our pawns, it's only one single pawn island. All my uh, six pawns are connected. All six of his pawns are connected. His pawns are a little bit looser, but this would be a very hard endgame to win, right? I'm a higher rated um, opponent. I'm higher rated than Ral, but uh, I don't know if that enough would be uh, enough to uh, try and win this. So queen d2 was a better chance. Instead, he took with the pawn right away, and again, re-reached this position. I play d6 first, because I was in no rush to take the pawn. And after bishop g2, only now do I take it with the bishop. And again, the long-term strategy is quite simple. I'm going to try and win this pawn, and if I do, um, this pawn, which as we can see is a protected pass pawn, it will eventually, I, in a perfect world, whoops, not go there, it will march its way to the queen square. That's the idea. And then here is where Raoul makes his second mistake, and it's a very natural common mistake, because clearly in this position, white wants to castle. Obviously, so he can get his rook into the game, king of the center, and prepare to defend his queen side. However, if he castles right now, um, that pawn is hanging. So he has to do something about that. Or at least, that's likely how my opponent thought. He thought that if he castled, sorry, he played bishop f3 in the game, he thought that if he were to castle, he's going to lose a pawn. And what he didn't notice, or what he failed to appreciate, is that if... Once the rook moves over, well, my bishop has to move. Let's do this instead. He's able to actually win the pawn right back. And he's got a perfectly fine position. Okay, sure, I'm going to win this pawn. But much better than the game. Instead, he played bishop f3. And this gives me a whole load of time. And now the natural move, of course, is knight d7. And I played this. But I played it after about 15 minutes of thought, because 
I'll be honest, I tried to be too clever. And sometimes this happens, especially when you, maybe you can relate this. If you are the higher rated opponent, you want to prove that you're a better player. And sometimes you do moves that, um, how do we put it? Uh, you know, you do a move that tries to show, aha, you know, with a little bit of flourish. And then, you know, trying to show that you're, you know, you're a hot dog. It's like, aha, this is a move that you would never consider. And the move that I was considering was bishop c8, with the idea that the rook is now attacking the pawn, so we need to defend that. And then let's say he plays uh, rook a1, that I would play bishop h3, so he can't castle, so that this rook is stuck out of the game. And then I'm happy, and this is going to be amazing. And I was really trying to convince myself to play this way, because this would be... Again, this is me showing how much better I am than my opponent, that I found this backwards move to come over here to take advantage of his bishop moving. But in reality, this isn't actually that good. I mean, it's not terrible, but he can just play a4. Now his, uh, his pawn is here. He's able to play his knight to c4. His king comes to d2. The rook will be able to slide over. My bishop is doing nothing, and all of his pieces are on good squares. And... As much as this pawn is a weakness, if he can push it up enough, um, it becomes a strength. And the last video that I posted shows me... shows... It showed me losing a game because I did not pay enough attention to a pawn advancing. I had the position completely under control, I was better, but that pawn was enough to cause... I overlooked it essentially, and the pawn cost me the game. Something similar could happen here. The other move I was thinking about, maybe I could do something like this. You know, I could play, you know, knight, rook, a3 to stop the pawn. This looks really tempting. But then, after either knight c4 or knight b1, let's just do knight b1, my rook would have to move, then he can castle, and so now this bishop has undeveloped itself. Where is it going to go? If it comes right back here, it looks kind of silly. If it goes here, okay, you can move the rook. N nothing's happened. And so, um, you have to be careful. You have to make sure when, you, when you're um, playing chess is that um, your good ideas are actually good ideas, and it's not just you, again, trying to be too clever. Sometimes the simple move is the move. So I played, of course, knight d7 is the move. White was able to castle, and now knight e5. And so now there actually is a threat. I'm attacking the bishop. If the bishop were to simply retreat... I can win the pawn, because after he moves over, and I move the bishop somewhere, the knight is blocking the, uh, the pawn, and he can't kick me away, because knight d3 is a fork, hitting both rooks, and white simply lost here. And so that means he can't move the bishop, but if he can't move the bishop, I'm threatening to simply take it, and again, win the pawn right after. So he plays rook e1, Let's see if I can actually put it on the board. Here we go. Rook e1. And then I took. Um, taking is a perfectly good move. The computer suggests that there is no rush to do this. And I could perhaps play rook b8 immediately. I'm still threatening to take the bishop. And if he spends time, you know, move the bishop somewhere. Okay, I, let's move it back. I can then jump in here. And now this pawn is going to fall... And I, I have a really, really good knight. The knight is much better than the bishop. Maybe I don't want to take it. And again, he can never play e4. There's forks coming in. Uh, f4 is just a weakness. And uh, white's in trouble. At, at the same time, I took. Because the idea is he can't really take with the knight. If he takes with the knight, well, for one reason, the knight has no good squares over here. Like, where can the knight go? Like, here? What's it doing? It's by itself. It's doing nothing. And after uh, bishop b7 in particular, I'm attacking the, the pawn like this. I'm attacking this pawn. I'm going to win one of the pawns, and white's probably lost. So instead, um, he takes the pawn, which is um, the best move. Notice how now the rook is attacking uh, my pawn, so I have to take a turn to defend it. And now it's white's turn again. He's able to play knight. Now his knight comes to a better square. This is the best move for the knight, because now if I try to play bishop b7 with the same idea, attacking the two pawns, he'd be able to play knight c3, which would uh, defend both of them. So good play for my opponent. And here, again, we're fully into an endgame. 
I want to get both my rooks over here on the king side. Sorry, the queen side. Right? They have open files, and I get my long-term plan, attack, and win this pawn. But as long as he has pressure on the e-file, I can't do that. Also notice that this pin, um, though my uh, rook is defending this pawn, there could be a pin here. So for instance, if I were to do something silly, like rook a7, because maybe I want double rooks, he could play knight f6, or knight takes d6, and then after take, take, um, I've lost the rook. So I gotta be careful. So that's why I played, after knight e4, king f8. So I'm sidestepping the pin, and things are great. He plays a4, and now here comes, um, I don't want to say it's the pivotal moment, but I think once I found this maneuver, I was very confident that I would win this game. Or my opponent had to defend very, very hard. I want to play rook b8. However, if I do that right now, he'll just play rook b8 himself. We'll trade all the rooks. And we got to be careful, because if all the rooks get traded, it's going to be hard to win the queenside pawn. It's much easier to win weak pawns with rooks right, than uh, with, with bishops. Because, for instance, if this pawn ever comes to a dark square, my bishop can never attack it. So i got to somehow stop rook b8. What I found, then, my, my idea, was bishop d3. So I control that square, and then, okay, he plays knight c3, I take control of the b-file, he attacks my bishop, I lock my bishop down. And starting from here, uh, my, the theme of my play is restricting what my opponent can do. And poor Raoul never really gets a chance to threaten too much from here. And his pieces get tied down. And again, this is the way that I love playing. He plays rook d2, which is as fine a move as any. I bring my rook in. So, of course, I'm simply infiltrating. And now, this rook is tied down to the defense of this knight. So this rook can't move anywhere, uh, or the knight falls. And so, I'm restricting him. He plays rook a2, so he has another defender. Maybe he wants to push his pawn. So I play rook a5. Again, I'm stopping his play. I'm just, a note here is that I really wanted to play rook b8 here, because this sets a trap. If he pushes the pawn, I would be able to simply take the knight, and then after take, rook, boom, boom, it's checkmate. Okay, uh, technically now it's checkmate. So that, that would be a really easy trap to fall for. However, if he does anything else, let's say he plays f4, or just about any move, then the checkmate threat is gone, and he really is threatening to push this pawn really, really quickly. And so, again, there's no point for playing for simple tricks, you know, for traps. So after, sorry, rook a5 instead, it starts being really hard to find a good move for white. Again, um, if this rook moves, he loses the knight. If the knight starts moving, then um, this pawn will fall. This pawn is now also being attacked, so that's quite nice. If the knight moves, then this pawn might start marching very, very quickly, so the knight really needs to watch this blockade. And if this rook moves, well, where is it going to go? It has no good squares. Everything is defended by me, and going to d2 does nothing. So my opponent has very few chances here. So he, he plays f4, and so I've got to think of my idea. What am I going to do? And of course, the goal is to eventually queen a pawn. This is the pawn I want, but right now it's blockaded. How can I increase the pressure? And the, my idea was e6, because after take, take, now my d pawn is free to run. Oops. And that's just going to be uh, very difficult to stop. At this point, it's... Um, White has a, a very difficult time to see if he can actually defend this. He tries. He plays f3 to get his king in. I play d5, king f2, d4, continue with my plan. He brings the knight down to e2, uh, which is an interesting moment, actually. He's attacking the pawn, and so I have two options. I either take it, or I defend it. This, this move would be perfect if he didn't have an a-pawn because after a5 i didn't know this looked too risky to me 
which is why I didn't do it. The computer says that this wins pretty much by force, actually, if I would have found this. Let's look at the line, because it's quite interesting. So it starts with c3. Well, let's say he keeps pushing his pawn, right? Well, the threat then would be rook b2. So obviously, I'm attacking the rook, hitting the knight. What does he do? Let's say he takes. Well, then after the pawn takes, uh, the, I'm controlling the queening square. I'm going to queen before he queens. I'm attacking the rook, and that's just game. So the black um, queening threat is much faster than the white queening threat, which makes sense. So when we look back here, um, black pawns are much more advanced and they have more support. So that would have won instantly. The move I played was still very, very good. It kept control of the position, but white has more drawing opportunities. And we'll see that more in the second video, actually. Bishop takes e2, king takes e2. And so now I played rook b4 and then rook a1, defending the pawn. And it's at this point where it appears that white is lost. It's very hard to find um, an improvement for white. White needed to find one move here, and that would be uh, rook d1 first. With the idea of after I, wait, uh-oh, did I get my now? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, all right, sorry. Yeah, the idea is after d1, it looks like after d3, king moves, so that we can simply win the pawn. And that is true. However, there's a very strong blockade here. And it's difficult for um, black to make easy progress. For instance, if we ever move the rook, we simply lose this pawn. And then the other pawn is going to drop. And it, my king is really far away. This position, now that said, black still is up a pawn. And we'll explore this position more in the second video. Uh, because if white can draw, it's in this position. Because if we see what happened, um, by playing rook a1, is now both of his rooks are tied up to defense of this pawn. And look at these pawns. Uh, they just control everything. So his king can't come closer. I have all the time in the world to bring my king up. And then the pawn's just going to roll. If I were to make a mistake, for instance, if I were to play c3 here, he could play king d3, and all of a sudden it's not sure if I can even make progress anymore. There's a good chance it's a draw, because my pawns are now simply stuck. And if I try and move my rooks away from this pawn, well, he can move his rooks away from that pawn. And uh, it's very, very difficult, because my pawns are now blockaded. If I can keep my pawns together, they have so much strength, and it's much harder for white. And we'll see that. We just play natural moves here. So I bring my king in. He moves his king in. I attack his pawn. Well, he attacks my pawn. Now, again, it'd be a big mistake to play um, c3, uh, king d3, and then again, that blockade is very difficult to stop. Or to break through, sorry. And so after rook c2, well, I just moved my rook right back. He moved it right back. Okay, no worries. I moved my king in. He moves his king in, and now I can play rook b3. And it's very hard to defend that pawn. White really has uh, two options, right? He could play rook a3, like he does in the game, or he could play rook f1. The problem with rook f1, well, there's a couple problems. For one, uh, playing d3, now there's no blockade anymore, and c3 is going to come very quickly. The second problem is that this pawn has... Uh, no defender, and it's going to fall very quickly after um, this comes in. There's no defense to that. And then I can just move all my um, forces uh, going here, and it'll be game over quite quickly. He instead played rook a3, which loses in a pretty similar way, actually. So take, take, move my king up. He moves his rook back. King up. Now he attacks my pawn. I think... A slightly more tenacious defense would have been something like this, where he checks, I would take the pawn, and then he could bring his rook in like this. Um, black's still winning here, but white has chances, right? Because we can come behind the pawns and harass them this way. We're also stopping the uh, black king from getting out, and so that's going to take a bit more time. And 
it's harder for black to uh, prove this. At the same time, black is up a pawn, and the pawns are very, very quick. Even if white does win this pawn, there's um, he has got no pawns coming himself. As it was, he played king e1, then I was able to take, and he took. So in this particular case, material is equal. Uh, we both have four pawns. The difference is I have two uh, connected pass pawns, a very active king, and a very active rook, and I simply sweep him away. Now, this is kind of a nice finish as far as endgames go. So d3, I check him, he comes over, I check him, I check him. He's got to be careful because if he, if he tries to uh, move over here, well, all of a sudden we're threatening checkmate. Like this. Okay, and if he does something like this, I can just block it. That's also threatening checkmate. Take, take, and that's going to be game over. He instead played uh, b2, but this allowed me to sacrifice uh, the rook, getting him away from the queening square, and then he resigned just to uh, move later. We did a, we chatted a little bit about the game. But that was it. And so if we look at that, we just back up really, really quickly. It was right here where I felt very, very confident about that. And if we can see simply um, the logical flow of this game. I've been working on my end games. I've been trying to improve my end games for a while. And um, this kind of shows that the work is starting to pay off. Because the game really, really flowed from this point on. Right? I'm defending. I defend my weakness. And then I'm stopping um, him from trading off my rooks. And then I just completely stop his counterplay. There's so little that he can do. It's also so hard to get his king in because his pawns are doubled. We see how the bishop is controlling this square. And so the only way for his king to get in is to move a pawn and then it's gonna take, you know, 75 moves. And at that point, my king is already at his doorstep. And that's what happened, right? Is my king, okay, first get the pawns going. Was able to, Even though he had a head start, my king was able to actually get to the danger zone Right here, faster than him, and just a really uh, good game, which makes up for the, the last game that I played in which I got a similar position and then I just blew it by calculating incorrectly. Frick, that still uh, riles my goat up a little bit. But that's the idea, right? So that's the general overview of the game, and so now in this next game, or sorry, the next video, the second part, is I want to really analyze this end game. Because Ral asked an interesting question. He, he said, when, when was I lost? When was the game over? When did he have no more chances? And at first I'm thinking, oh, it must be, you know, okay, right here he was lost. Okay, what about here? Or here, or here. And I suddenly realized as I was looking at this game, analyzing it afterwards, that black was, uh, may have been winning all the way back here. But to find out, to really prove that, we'll look back in the second video, in which we're going to actually reverse engineer the end game, um, which I think will be really, really interesting. So, um, that's that. Um, hopefully you found this, you know, at, at all interesting, if end games can be interesting. And, uh, Stay tuned for part two. Okay, so again, SpithyQ, SpithyQ.com. Um, comments, you know, what you like, didn't like, let me know. And uh, stay tuned for part two. Okay, so thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.